Good morning. Okay, you can do way better than that. Good morning. Thank you. Good morning to all those who are joining us online as well at home. Uh, beautiful sunny day, a little different from uh, yesterday morning when we woke up. Uh, but I do want to let you know that uh, following the business meeting yesterday, um, we felt led as leaders to uh, provide, I know there was a slideshow at the part of the business meeting, so there's copies of that slideshow out on the table so that you can see the unfolding plans that we have for the church moving forward in terms of our elders, our leadership, and our structures and our charts and all that stuff, so they're available uh, out in the foyer for you to use today. This is uh, Palm Sunday, and uh, that's an exciting day for us, especially as we start recognizing the great love of Jesus as he entered into Jerusalem, uh, the beginning of what some call the Passion Week, where his, his week would be up and down all over the place, and it would eventually lead him to the cross, and where he would offer his life for ours, and where God would eventually raise him from the dead, uh, a great, great miracle of the Lord. Uh, so this is a very special day for us, and it's an opportunity for us today to really think about in our own hearts and minds, you know, what does Jesus mean to us? And I know Tim Strickland is here this morning uh, visiting with us to uh, preach, and he's going to be bringing that message. What is Jesus to us? So that's a question we need to think of today and respond to today. Uh, just a few reminders. Uh, next, Friday, uh, next Friday is our Good Friday service. We have a service at 10 o'clock in the morning. Uh, with the Lord's Table, with communion, and then Easter Sunday service will be at 10 o'clock as well. Encourage you to get here early for next Sunday, Easter, if you're planning on coming in person, because it'll probably be pretty full. So come early, okay? Come early so you have a seat uh, for next Sunday. Just a note, too, from our children's ministries. Um, sometimes our church services end at different times, a little bit, sometimes closer to 11, sometimes closer to 11.30. If we end early, please, uh, and you have children in the children's ministries, wait till at least 11.15 to go and pick up the kids. It allows them to fill their, uh, complete their uh, Sunday ministry with the children. So don't go and pick them up at 11 if we get out early. You know, wait until 11.15. Socialize with some people, you know, move, shovel or whatever you want to do here, you know, whatever needs to be done around the church. But just enjoy uh, spending some time getting to know uh, people around here. Uh, and uh, finally, just a, a reminder um, that if you are not connected to us, we can communicate uh, clearly every week through our uh, email prayer chain and through our email uh, contact list. So if you'd like to be added to those lists, please speak to myself or to Margaret, our church secretary, and uh, we can add you to our list so that you're getting all the information on a weekly basis. Well, let's just uh, offer ourselves to the Lord this morning, offer this time to him, and uh, let's just bow our heads and thank the Lord. God, you are so good to us, and this Palm Sunday, Lord, uh, the very visual image of Jesus riding into Jerusalem, uh, Lord, with people honoring him, throwing garments, throwing palm branches, waving palm branches, Lord, to pave the way for Jesus to enter. Lord, we also know in other parts of the story that there were some who were not happy with his entry. They weren't happy with all the fuss over Jesus. And so, God, the world hasn't changed too much. Uh, this Palm Sunday, God, we recognize that we are here to celebrate and to praise the Lord and to thank you for Jesus who forgives our sins. Lord, we also know we live in a world that is uh, very much against Jesus and against uh, what he does in transforming people's lives. And so, Lord, we pray this morning you will move in our service. God, that we will honor you and glorify you and praise your name and, and be ultimately so thankful that we can be in relationship with Jesus Christ, your son. So thankful, God, that we can sing praise and, and hear a word preached from your word. And uh, Lord, just thankful that we can pray in your name. So Father, bless our time, we pray. Uh, as we gather in your name, Lord, may your name be lifted up. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Good morning, everybody. You're all glad to be here this morning, right? Really? <laughs> Not very convincing. You're all glad to be here this morning, right? Yeah, that's better. So the scripture this morning that I'm going to share is from Matthew 21. And it's talking about Christ making his triumphal entry. It says, Hosanna to the son of David. 
Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. We're going to sing songs. We're going to just go right from one right into the next. And these are all songs about who Christ is. We're going to praise his name. He's our king of kings. He's the son of God. He is our Messiah. He is our savior. He is our Lord. We're going to sing all about who Jesus is this morning. I'm going to ask if you'll stand up. And we're going to sing, before we get started, we're going to sing Hosanna. I wish we had palm branches to wave, but seeing as we don't, if you want to pretend, you can. (laughs) But we're going to sing Hosanna, Hosanna.
this next song can be your testimony this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, we are so grateful and so thankful that you came 2,000 years ago, that you gave your life on that tree for our sins, so that today, Father, we can say that you are our Lord, and you are our Savior, and you are our Master, and our Prince of Peace, and Lord, we are so grateful that we can call you Father, and we just praise you and thank you. We just ask this morning, Lord, that you would be with the pastor as he preaches his message, Lord, that you would bless and anoint every word that he says, and that th that his blessings will go forward on this congregation and those who are watching at home. Father, we praise you for this day. We thank you once again for your incredible, amazing sacrifice that you gave for us. We just ask that you would go before us this day in Jesus' name. Amen. Would the ushers please come forward? Let's pray now over the offering. Father, we read in your word that every good and perfect gift comes from above, from the Father of lights, in whom there is no change or shadow of turning. Father, you have blessed us with gifts beyond comprehension, the remission of sin, the seal of the Holy Spirit, and the hope of life eternal. 
Oh, we are a thankful people this morning. As we look to this offering, we ask that as it's deposited into the treasury of the universal church, that you would use it for the furtherance of your gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, that souls may be saved, that repentant sinners might say, Jesus, my Lord and Savior, the one who died for me. Father, we thank you that we can give. And as Jesus teaches, for the one who gives from their little, from their poverty, it, re- it is received as much. We just pray for those who, who give from their poverty that they would be blessed. We just thank you that we can give and we acknowledge that all that we give comes from you, both spiritually and physically. Father, thank you again. In Jesus' name, amen. And every time we come to this time of year, it astounds me the determination and the, um, the diligence of Jesus as he's entering into Jerusalem. The whole concept of uh, his years of ministry, his life to this point leading up to this moment where he will face the reality of his death. He will face the reality of why he was called in the pers- first place by God uh, to, to be the sacrifice for our sin. Uh, you know, sometimes when I think about that, I think how far off I am from that self-sacrificing attitude, how far off I am, um, and yet Jesus reminds us, he rides in humbly, facing his death, uh, willing to give up himself for, for us, but to glorify God. What a, what a great witness for us, and what a great example for us to follow. Let's uh, turn to the Lord in prayer. Let's offer uh, ourselves to him in prayer. Heavenly Father... God, teach us to be like Jesus, and teach us to be like him in the attitude that he displayed, Lord, while on earth. God, the attitude of willing to go and face the persecution, willing to face the hatred of people, willing to face the ultimate pain and suffering that was due to us. God, thank you that... He went so willingly, so thankfully that he could serve you in this way. Heavenly Father, we are astounded by the love of our our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This morning, it is overwhelming to think of someone loving us that much that they would offer themselves on on our behalf. God, that they would take the sin of the world on their shoulders and carry our weight. Lord, that through his stripes we would be healed. God, thank you. Thank you, Lord, for those who recognized the importance of Jesus on that day, who, Lord, honored and praised his name, who laid down whatever they could to make a carpet, so to speak, of of various items, Lord, that are fitting for a king to enter into a city. God, thank you. For the recognition that day of Jesus and his life and his willingness to serve you in this way. And God, we pray today that we will come with that same heart. Lord, that we will honor and glorify your name. Lord, that we will do what is required of us and more, Lord, as we recognize this beautiful love that God our Father has for us. Lord, may we be moved this morning out of our comfort, out of our Um, easy way of living God out of our repetitive kind of life Lord that is easy to 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 do but God we pray this morning you would disturb us and disrupt us a bit and Lord that we might find in Jesus the one who has called us to follow him the one who has called us to follow him in his suffering but also Lord in his glorification God thank you that we can be forgiven. Thank you for making that possible. Thank you, God, for your love for us. And as we come before you this morning, Lord, may this time of worship just be 
uh, a moment of our week in which we can offer praise and thanksgiving to who you are. You are so good. And you are so beautiful in all that you do. And you have a purpose and a plan behind everything, God. Some might look at Jesus' death on the cross and be surprised that his father would allow him to go through that. But God, we thank you for your purpose and plan that was accomplished through your son. And Lord, you still have a purpose and plan for us. Help us, God, to recognize your purpose and plan. We thank you, God, this, this week for the beautiful reminders of your care and your love. We thank you for Katie's release from the hospital. Lord, back home, we pray, God, for continued healing uh, for this little one, Lord, and continue to support and strengthen her, her family through this time. But God, just thank you that uh, she's made a, a good response this week, and Lord, continue to watch over her. God, for Dave, uh, who had uh, a positive outcome of the trial, long-awaited uh, trial and outcome, Lord, just, just, God, just thank you for that family and continue to lift them up in our prayers. God, and now that this is behind them, Lord, may they uh, look forward to uh, a peaceful time. And God, may they just be reminded of your love and your care over them. Lord, we thank you for the word of God that is coming to us this morning. In so many parts of our world, God, the word of God can't be read in public or you can't even hold a Bible in your hand. And yet, Lord, this morning we are here and we're able to praise and glorify your name and hear uh, your message through Tim. So, Lord, speak through him, we pray, and, and reach us, God, we pray. Uh, Father, for those who are in need, we think of Lori's son, Miles, God, with many blood clots happening in his body, and Lord, just his living circumstances are just terrible, Lord, so please answer that prayer and for, provide for this young man. For Brenda, God, and for others, Lord, we think of Chris, who's awaiting uh, appointments, uh, Lord, for, for Brian uh, and others who have uh, medical uh, conditions, physical problems, Lord, we pray that you will provide for them. God, give good answers this week. Uh, may we not give up faith. May we not give up hope in that you are a God who listens and answers. And even though sometimes, Lord, it's delayed, it's in your time. So, Lord, help us to concede to your timing. God, for Rico and Orlando, just grieving the loss of his mom years ago, Father, uh, we just uh, help, help them, Lord, help them through this time as they remember. And Lord, help them be thankful uh, for the gift of her life to them. Uh, God, for our elders, as we move forward and try to navigate through a changing um, system here at the church and trying to hear your voice, God, we pray that you will speak to the elders and, Lord, that we will be unified and, and direct in how you would like us to go. Uh, God, help us to be patient for your voice. And Father, we just think of all the ministries that we support. Um, just thankful, God, that we can uh, support ministries financially, prayerfully. Uh, Lord, continue to provide for those, especially locally here, Lord, who need, um, who need a lot of encouragement, God, who are finding the homeless conditions so overwhelming, God, we pray that you will bring answers, whether it's through government or whether it's through other agencies, God, we pray you'll provide answers. Lord, for our search committee, uh, thank you, God, for their uh, diligence. Thank you for their patience. Uh, Lord, again, uh, our will would have been uh, maybe different from where we are today, but God, you have a plan and a purpose in this. So help us, God, to concede again to you and to your will. And uh, Lord, thank you that you are building your church here in the meantime. Uh, Lord, continue to guide our search committee, continue to guide um, candidates, Lord, to their door so that, Lord, we will see the right fit for the right person who will come and lead us. And God, as we look around us, we just see the overwhelming needs of our world. We see the conflict that is happening in pretty much every corner of this, of this planet, God. Um, every part of this world seems to be... Uh, at odds with others. And Lord, it's, it's simply because everybody hasn't grasped the concept yet that you are the Prince of Peace. You are the Lord of Lords. You are the King of Kings. And until we come before you, Lord, and bow our knee and acknowledge your greatness, we will live in conflict. So God, I pray for you to help the regions. We think of the, uh, what's happening in Israel and with Hamas, Lord. We pray for, for a peaceful reconciliation there, God, for Ukraine, uh, what is going on there for years now in the Middle East, Africa, 
what's going on right now in Haiti, Lord, is just disastrous. And so, Lord, we pray for these, these nations, Lord, that you will uh, bring peace. And God, that you will intervene. It's a lot to ask, God, but you are big. <laughs> you are much bigger than we give you credit for. And so, Lord, please answer these prayers that we might glorify and praise your name and give you all the, uh, the reverence and the respect that you are due. God, as uh, Tim comes to share uh, his message with us this morning, Lord, may we hear your words, may we be challenged by your word, and may we be encouraged by you today. We praise you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning, Harmony Road. Good to see you all here. Good to be back with you. It feels like I was just here recently, but it was actually four or five months ago, I guess. Four months ago, we were at the consultation with Bob Fleming, and we had a great time here and then in the gym. And it sounds like you've been working on some of the things we talked about during that consultation, and I'm excited to hear that for sure. Now, the message I want to bring today is a Palm Sunday message. It's called Palm Sunday, of course, because it was the day before Easter, a week before Easter, when Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a donkey, and they waved the palm branches and laid them before him. And it's a special, really an amazing Sunday that happened all those years ago. And we are going to take a look deeper into that today to learn about Palm Sunday, what it means, and what it means for each of us in our lives. And the key question, who is this, that they asked when Jesus rode into town? Now, as I start this message, it makes me think about royalty, because this was the arrival of the king on that day in Jerusalem. Now, have you ever been in a situation or a place where royalty was arriving or somebody very famous and important was coming into the town and people were clamoring to see that person? Maybe in Toronto some years ago, you went to see one of the royals. Uh, maybe it was the queen or one, one of the key royal figures. Just this past couple weeks, we've been thinking of them with Princess Kate announcing, of course, that she has cancer, which we're all sad to hear. And you can just see when a, a royal speaks and it's something severe like that, everyone turns their attention. Of course, our prayers will be with her and the family that, they, that she would do well. But there's something in us that, that God's put there that wants to see a righteous and good king reigning and ruling. We, we want good leadership. We want someone who will care for us, who will, who will love us and do justice and righteousness for our nation and for our world. And, and we often, you know, think when there's a new elected leader coming up, we always think maybe this will be the one who really does well. And we're kind of like Charlie Brown and Lucy with the football. Do you know that? Do you remember Charlie Brown and Lucy with the football? She would say, this time I'll hold the football, and you can kick it, Charlie Brown. And every time she would pull it away, and he would go flying. And when we think there's a new leader who's going to be the one, it's kind of the same thing, because in a few years, we're like, I don't think that was the one. I think I missed the football again. <laughs> and yet something in us wants a ruler, a leader like that. When Jesus came, he often spoke about the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. And this phrase happens so often in the Gospels. I wonder, what does it mean? Well, this kingdom, what is it? Well, a kingdom is simply the realm, the area, where a king reigns. So to have a kingdom, you need an area, a space, a world such as this, and you need a king. And the Lord Jesus is that king who reigns over the kingdom of heaven. Right now, it's not come into full bloom. It's a spiritual kingdom where Jesus reigns in the lives of everyone who trusts in him. And across this room, I believe there's people who are trusting in him today. But if you've never put your faith in, then you haven't yet entered into that kingdom. But Jesus invites you to be in this kingdom. He said, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He went around preaching teaching, healing, sharing this good news of the kingdom. And when we come to Palm Sunday, there is the king riding into Jerusalem. I want to invite you to turn your Bible to Matthew 21, verses 1 to 11. We're going to read this famous story on Palm Sunday, starting at verse 1 of Matthew 21. 
It says, now when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethphage, to the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, go into the village in front of you and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, the Lord needs them and he will send them at once. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put on them their cloaks, and he sat on them. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred, stirred up saying, who is this? And the crowds said, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. Let's just pause for a word of prayer at this reading of God's word. Lord Jesus, I thank you for the passage we just read, for your triumphal entry into Jerusalem about 2,000 years ago, in that week that would change the world. I pray your blessing on your word as we look into it, as we talk about it. And if anyone here today has not put their trust in you, I pray that today would be the day they would answer that question, who is this? This is my king. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I want to start the message by looking at some pictures of the setting, because I think it's important to understand what was going on and what it looked like approximately on that day. I've got some pictures up here that I'm going to show you. Go ahead and jump to the first one. This is a picture of Jerusalem at the time of Jesus. This is taken out of the ESV study Bible, which by the way is an excellent study Bible. So many good pictures and diagrams as well as the Word of God and notes. But that picture there shows the city. On the right, you can see the Temple Mount. And along the right-hand side, that's the Kidron Valley. And we'll we'll show a slide in a moment where we see the Mount of Olives is directly to the right. It's a ridge that runs for about two miles alongside Jerusalem. Now, just to give you an idea of the size, this is not huge uh, by the standards of modern cities. Um, I took a look on a map. I was looking at Oshawa and trying to think, where would this fit in? And this would fit, if you can imagine going from here at the church to the 401 and then over to Ritson, this city would fit in that block. It's about a little over a square kilometer, but not much bigger than that. It's not, it's not like Toronto or some massive spread out city with cars like we have today. This is an ancient city, the old city of Jerusalem. And again, this is a beautiful picture just illustrating what Jesus would have been coming into that day. Now, note that it was the Passover. This is the huge celebration, remembering back to the Exodus. I was reading in my Bible reading through the Exodus yesterday and reading about the Passover and how God gave the instructions after Israel was being freed from, uh, while Israel was being freed from Egypt and Pharaoh wouldn't let them go and the Passover happened. And it was the story how they had to put the blood of a lamb on their doorpost. And when the angel of death came by who would take the firstborn of Egypt... Only those who had the blood of the lamb would be saved at that moment. It was clearly a foreshadowing of the death of Jesus. And the Passover continues to be celebrated and remembered to this day. Of course, as believers, we celebrate it with the new covenant with Jesus. But there it was, the Passover. And there would have been hundreds of thousands, perhaps even a million people gathered in this area. Again, picture the area here to the 401 to Ritson. A million people cramming into this one city, the holy city of Jerusalem, the great city of God. There for the temple, there to offer sacrifices, there to celebrate the Passover, where the blood of the Lamb covers them and protects them from judgment. What a moment that was. Let's look at another picture here. This is looking from the top, same 
picture, but looking from the top, same place. You can see the city of Jerusalem, the temple in the middle, and then the Mount of Olives is on the right. And so Jesus is coming from the right of the picture down, and you see there they think it may be Bethphage. I think we just read about Bethphage there in chapter 21. Down there and into the city gates by the temple. Let's take a look at another one. This is what it looks like on Google Maps. I took this clip a number of years ago off of Google Maps. Now, you can see it's not the temple there today. It's, uh, it's the Dome of the Rock, the, uh, the famous mosque there. But you can see on the right, the Mount of Olives is on the right, and the old city of Jerusalem, you can vaguely see the lines of the old city still there today. I, something I love about the scriptures when you're reading it, you're reading about real places and real things. And this is what it looks like today from Google Earth. Take a look at the next one, if you will. This is a scene of the Mount of Olives. Now, there wouldn't have been tour buses in Jesus' day. Uh, but nonetheless, what I want you to notice is, what is that in the Mount of Olives? What, what, what is that? Does anybody know? It's a cemetery. Those are graves. They, they estimate there's between 150 and 300,000 people buried on the Mount of Olives. It's, it's a huge cemetery, and there are these above-ground uh, you know, um, graves that they have, and this dates back almost 3,000 years. And, you know, I'm, there's not, I would guess, certainty about all the people buried there, but it's suggested that Absalom, the son of David, is actually buried there, Haggai, the prophet who wrote the book Haggai, Zechariah, and uh, I forget the other one, I'll have to look in my notes, <laughs> but some of the, just, there, it, it's an ancient, ancient cemetery where some of the uh, really heroes of Israel were buried and famous rabbis buried. That's, again, the scene. The Mount of Olives isn't... It was famous, by the way, long before Jesus would go there in the Garden of Gethsemane or long before Palm Sunday because the prophet Zechariah had made a prophecy about the Mount of Olives. And we're going to read that in a few minutes. But he prophesied that that's where the Messiah would return. And the reason for all these graves is that everybody wanted to be at ground zero <laughs> when the Messiah returns. So, I mean, I can't imagine what it costs to get buried there, or even if you can, it's pretty packed with people, because they all wanted to be where the Messiah would return in their grave. Isn't that something? It's just a visual representation that sits there today, reminding of the prophecy of the Messiah. Take a look again at another one. This is what the scene looks like looking from the Mount of Olives to Jerusalem. Again, it's not the temple, it's, it's the mosque there. But this is the scene, if you can imagine the temple there that Jesus is looking on when he comes in. And let's go to the next one. I really like this one. It's a painting from 1870 that is, you know, a little bit older, and it just gives to me a bit of a better glimpse of what it might have looked like for Jesus coming on that day. It's, it's a beautiful painting, really, looking from the Mount of Olives towards the city of Jerusalem. Again, the mosque had been built. It's still there. But it gives you just a, a better idea of what this scene is. But again, it's, it's a little different from this in that here there's about three people, maybe four in the picture. In reality, there was hundreds of thousands, upwards of a million people all crammed into this area for the Passover when Jesus comes. Do you get the scene? Do you get the feeling of what it's like? It's a tremendous moment. Um, sometimes we see a, a film or a movie about the life of Jesus, and there's about five people waving branches because they couldn't afford enough extras, I guess. <laughs> it, it, imagine something like that, but multiplied by a thousand <laughs> in terms of the people, the energy, the excitement, the, 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 really the craziness of the whole scene as the king comes in. That's the setting geographically, but I want to talk about the setting prophetically as well. When we talk about this day, this Palm Sunday, we see a prophecy that we just read in uh, Matthew 21, and I want to jump back in the book of Zechariah. You don't have to turn there, but I'll make note of it, and it's in, did you get, did you get notes, by the way, on the sermon? Have you got that? It's in your notes, I believe, as well. Zechariah chapter 9. The prophet Zechariah was one of the what we call the minor prophets in the Old Testament, but his prophecy was not minor. Uh, it's the book right before the end of the Old Testament, Zechariah, then Malachi, then we come to the New Testament, Matthew. And in Zechariah 9, verse 9, the prophet, writing 500 or so years before the time of Jesus, says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion! 
Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he. Humble and mounted on a donkey. On a colt. On the foal of a donkey. I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem. The battle bow shall be cut off and he shall speak peace to the nations. His rule shall be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. So in this scene, Jesus is coming into Jerusalem riding on a donkey. And the Jewish people would have totally understood what was happening. Jesus wasn't being subtle that day. Uh, there were different times in the gospel where, you know, he says, don't tell anyone who, you know, you know who I am. Just let's keep, let's keep it a, a quote, secret. <laughs> I put quotes because it didn't always stay a secret. They told anyways. But when he does this, he's announcing himself. He's saying, I am the Messiah. I am the king. Because this prophecy was so known, and it's a prophecy of a king riding on a donkey. Now, we hear that, we think, well, donkeys, they're not the most impressive uh, animal out there. But we need to understand that in those days, a king would ride on a donkey. It was like a symbol of, of peace and, and kingship. And it wasn't maybe what we would think of a donkey sometimes today. And it's important to note, he wasn't riding a chariot or a war horse. It was mentioned about a chariot or war horse in this passage in Zechariah. But Jesus instead, he's not coming as a conquering king to take over the city. He's coming as a reigning king, offering peace. What it is, the Prince of Peace, Jesus, is offering peace to the people of Jerusalem on this Palm Sunday. It's actually an incredibly powerful picture. Because Jesus offers us peace with God. He is God himself and his sacrifice makes a way for us to be at peace. And the image of Palm Sunday is your king riding on a donkey coming into Jerusalem. But let's imagine riding here and saying peace is given to you. Peace is offered to you. You can have peace with God. That's the image. That's the picture of what is happening. It, it's a powerful picture, this offer of peace through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the setting, the physical setting, the prophetic setting. Everyone knows what is happening. The crowds arise up on this triumphal entry. He rides this colt down from the Mount of Olives. And the people see this. Again, the hundreds of thousands of people see what is happening. And the buzz runs through the city. The people who are there cry out, Hosanna! Hosanna! Hosanna in the highest! Hosanna! This is something. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. What is this word Hosanna mean? Well, it was a word of praise, praise to God, but it comes from the Psalms, as a matter of fact, a group of Psalms called the Hallel Psalms, and specifically from Psalm 118. I want to read to you what it says there. Psalm 118 verse 25 says, Save us, we pray, O Lord. O Lord, we pray, give us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. Save us, we pray. That's what Hosanna means. Save us. Save us, we pray. The one riding on the colt, do you know what his name is? Well, of course you do. It's Jesus. But do you know what his name means? Jesus means the Lord saves. So the people are crying, save us, save us. And the one whose mean name means the Lord saves is riding into town. It, it, it's rich when you understand what is happening in that story. It's like all the prophecies of the Old Testament, all the promises of the Bible are coming into focus in that moment as Jesus rides into town. The people crying out and praising God. They're laying palm branches on the ground in in thanksgiving and praise. Ah. They call him the son of David. Again, a prophetic word because they knew Messiah was to be in the line of David. 
Again, this is not subtle. Jesus is making a statement of who he is. And he's doing it in front of hundreds of thousands of people at the high season of the Jewish calendar, the Passover. And it's an amazing moment. I want to just review again what is going on here. I wrote it in my notes, and I want to just read a bit what I wrote. It says, let's look at the big picture of what is happening. Jesus is riding down from the Mount of Olives, the prophetic arrival point of the Lord. Remember, the prophet Zechariah had prophesied that that would be where Messiah would return. He's riding on the colt of the donkey, the prophetic animal that would carry the king. He's riding into Jerusalem, the royal city of Israel. He's being praised with loud hosannas, called the son of David, showing that the crowd recognized him as the promised messianic king on his procession into Jerusalem. He was being seen and talked about by hundreds of thousands of people amidst this Passover throng, all as he rode into Jerusalem as her king, fulfilling prophecy in their midst. Nothing subtle. Sometimes, again, we think of it as just a small scene and a few people waving branches. This is a massive scene. Everyone would have recognized the prophetic significance. And there would have been some who would have been upset. (laughs) Because who is Jesus to do this, they might have asked. We know the religious leaders of his day were upset with him already. Imagine how happy they were that day. When the whole city is rocking, literally shaking, with Jesus riding into town. Well, we come to verse 10 in Matthew 21. And we hear what the crowd is saying. It says, when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up. The word stirred in the Greek is where we get the English word seismic. This is, is not a minor stirring. This is, this is rocking. Think of when the Blue Jays or when, the, Ra- when the, the Raptors more recently were in the championship and the whole city is rocking. Do you remember that? That's what was going on. The whole city is stirred. Seismic. And they're saying, who is this? Who is this? Again, who is this? They're asking. Dear brothers, dear sisters, this is the question of the age, isn't it? This is the question. Who is this? This question is asked at different times in the Bible. In the book of Exodus, it was Pharaoh who asked it. He said, who is the Lord that I should obey his voice? And of course, he did not understand who the Lord was, and he did not obey his voice. In the book of Psalms, they would sing when they were going up to Jerusalem, who is this king of glory? Let the king of glory come in. Who is this? Isaiah spoke it. Who is this who is great, who is splendid in his apparel, marching in the greatness of his strength? It is I speaking in righteousness, mighty to save. It was said when Jesus gathered at a meal, who is this that even forgives sins? Herod even asked, saying, who is this about whom I hear such things? Jesus asked the disciples in the book of Matthew, who do people say that I am? People had all kinds of ideas about who Jesus might be, but it was Peter who said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. A key confession of who he is. How you answer that question is life and death. It's so important for every one of us. There's nothing more important to knowing who he is. What did the crowd say? Well, the crowd said, this is the prophet, Jesus, from Nazareth of Galilee. This is a case where they're all right and they're all wrong all at once. Everything is accurate that they said. Jesus is a prophet. He is from Nazareth in Galilee. Again, even in that, there's prophecy because Isaiah talked about someone coming from that area of Israel. But it's like they understand he's important, but they don't get how important. He's a prophet, maybe even the prophet that Moses had talked about. 
But they're not claiming him as their king. They're not claiming him as the Messiah. They're not claiming him as the Son of God. It's actually not that different from today, is it? There's all kinds of views about who Jesus is today. Many believe he was a great teacher or a great prophet. And he certainly was, both of those. But he's so much more. How will you answer the question, who is this? Remember that one week after this triumphal entry, of course, we'll celebrate Easter next weekend. The week that changed the world, it happened. One week after. The crowds who were cheering him as he came in, possibly some of those same ones were yelling, crucify him on Good Friday. And Jesus would be there the one who had come as their king offering peace, suffering a terrible, violent death, hanging on a Roman cross. The religious leaders of his day saying, we have no king but Caesar, clearly rejecting his kingship over them. And yet in that moment, the Hosanna, the Lord saves, was on full display. Save us, we pray. And Jesus is hanging there saying, and he's bringing salvation by his sacrificial death on the cross. Because that's the way the gospel of Jesus works, that to pay for our sins, someone has to die. It should be you and me. But instead, Jesus dies on the cross, his blood being shed, the blood on the doorpost, just like on the Passover, now it's the blood on the cross. And his sacrificial death is what covers you and me so that our sins can be forgiven, that we might be saved. Who is this? A prophet, yes. Son of David, yes. The one from Nazareth, yes. But oh, so much more. Who is this? This is our king. This is the king of the universe, our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who humbled himself, made himself nothing, being obedient to death, even death on the cross. But through that, as we'll celebrate next Sunday, God exalted him, raised him back to life, that all who would put their trust in him might be saved. I wonder, have you ever put your trust in this Jesus? I know many of you in this room have, but maybe there's someone here today who never has. Maybe you've been visiting Harmony Road listening to the messages, enjoying the fellowship and friendship this congregation so warmly offers. And you've been wondering, could this be real? Could this be true? Maybe today God is working in your heart because this is not just words on a page. This is a spiritual endeavor we're in. And the Lord works in people's hearts and maybe he's drawing you to himself. Opening your eyes to say, this is the king. This is the king of glory. This is the one who saves. Hosanna, save me, I pray. And Jesus saves. That's what he does. Will you put your trust in him today? What does that mean? Well, there's three things you do when you're putting your trust in Jesus. One is that you believe in Jesus and his death and resurrection, trusting that to save you from your sin. You repent of sin. That means you turn away from sin and trust him to help you to live life like he intended. And it means giving your life fully to him as Lord of your life. Will you believe? Will you repent? Will you trust in him? Will you give your life to him today? What better day than Palm Sunday to do that on the day where peace is offered to you through Jesus riding in Jerusalem? That offer still stands. There's coming a day in the future where Jesus will return again. He won't be on a donkey. He'll be on a white horse. It'll be a war horse riding in to claim this world as his own because it rightfully belongs to him. But in the meantime, he's offering peace and saying, come to me now before it's too late. Come now. I invite you, will you trust in Jesus today? On the back of your notes, I wrote a prayer. Um, a prayer of salvation. 
I wrote some scriptures at well that talk about how you trust in Jesus. For those of you who have put your trust in the Lord, you can use this and share this with others. Maybe just a way you can tell them what it means to trust in Jesus. But for those of you who have never put your trust in him, this is just a simple way that you can respond to the message today. I'm going to invite us to close our eyes and pray. And I'm going to say a prayer and then specifically pray this prayer of salvation. And you are welcome to pray in your heart with me. Lord Jesus, I thank you for Palm Sunday. I thank you for the vision of the King that you give us in this beautiful passage. I want to pray for every person here. I thank you for many who at some point in their life have said, Lord, I I surrender, I give my life to you. And they've never looked back. I thank you that you've saved so many here. I thank you for the one you've been bringing here over weeks or months, or maybe they just came once today with a family or friend. And I thank you, Lord, you brought them here to a place that shares your name, who loves you, and wants to offer that to everyone. And I pray for that person that they would put their trust in you. And we we pray this prayer of salvation, inviting anyone to pray along with us. Dear Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner and I need your forgiveness. I believe that you died and rose again to save me from my sins. Please forgive me and please be the Lord of my life. I receive you and give my life to you and put my full trust in you for now and forever. Thank you for hearing my prayer. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Dear brothers, dear sisters, if you prayed that prayer today, I'm going to stick around after. I'd love to talk to you, Pastor Dave Wood, and there's other leaders here you see around the church. We'd all love to talk and pray with you. What a joy it is to trust in Jesus. Congregation, may we have a blessed week worshiping our King as he arrives and as we celebrate this this Easter week. Amen. Would you please rise and we're going to sing the old hymn, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. Two.
I'm going to close the service with a benediction from the book of Hebrews. And again, I invite you, if you've responded to this message in your heart, come talk to myself or Pastor Dave. We'll be at the front at the end. May the Lord bless you and give you a wonderful week. Let's close in prayer. Now may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will working in us that which is pleasing in his sight. Through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Go with the grace of God.